Uh, go to Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, we're going to spend time in the first seven verses of that chapter. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah is in the Old Testament. Um, for those who are wondering where is that, that's Zechariah chapter 4. Verse 1 to 7. Uh, so today is actually the end of our mini-series um, in, in power. Uh, we are still speaking about the Holy Spirit, of course, uh, but it's the last message in that series called Power. Uh, from next week, we are going to be having uh, our Palm Sunday um, service, and then the week after that is our Friends and Family Day. And that's Resurrection Sunday. And again, I'm encouraging you to invite your friends and family to that. Um, you have friends and family that you know would come to church twice a year. There are some people that they come to church twice a year, right? One is Easter. And the other one is Christmas, right? So you have a perfect time to um, invite them knowing that they would come with you. So we're in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. And uh, today we're going to talk about power to do the impossible by my spirit, says the Lord. Power to do the impossible by my spirit, says the Lord. Are we all there? Yes. Amen. Okay. So, um, verse 1, I'm going to read. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. I just want to go to um, um, 8 and 9, um, so keep following. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your word not only guides us, but it refreshes us and it challenges us. And your word challenges us this morning and reminds us that it is not by our human strength that we do anything of worth. It is not by a physical might that we do anything of value before you, anything that is worth anything for eternity. It is by your spirit. It is by your spirit, Lord, spirit that you have given us as a deposit, as a, uh, as, as a future deposit for the glory that you will bestow upon us. Forgive us for those days, Lord, and those times that we have worked in our own might and in our own strength and have failed miserably. Thank you for the failures. Thank you. Thank you that when we did things that you call us to do in our own might, we failed because you wanted us to come to the realization that it is by your spirit, by your spirit. Father, my prayer is that every one of us would leave here this morning not only encouraged but challenged, challenged to do the work that you have called us to do, and the work that you have called them to do, that they would do it in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, as you often have heard me say, it is important that we get the context for this message. 
And I just want to uh, uh, go back a little bit into uh, what's the setting for this, what's the setting for uh, the book of Zechariah. Um, during the days of the nation of Judah, uh, whenever they had a righteous king, a good king, think Jehoshaphat, think Hezekiah, uh, things would go well. Whenever a man who followed after God's heart stood up to lead the people, things would go well and the nation would be righteous. But whenever that king was wicked or evil or he followed after his own heart, then the nation was led in disobedience. This is not the main point, but this is still important. Leadership matters. Leadership matters, whether it's leadership in the home. Uh, that's why Paul is telling Timothy uh, that the man who will stand up to be an elder, to be an overseer, to be a bishop in God's church must be a good spiritual leader. That also applies to nations, that we are called to pray for and to hope that our leaders, our political leaders, are uh, people of, val of virtue, sorry. Now, the, the bad thing for Judah, the nation of Judah, was that of the 19 kings and one queen that ruled over them, only five or six were righteous. The rest were rotten to the core. They were wicked. God didn't want to leave them in their wickedness, so he sent men, uh, prophets, men who heard from him. He sent them to go to the kings and to tell them, stop doing what you're doing, because if you continue doing that, you are going to get crushed. If you continue doing that, you are going uh, to feel the brunt of God's wrath. And he challenged them to change their behavior. Uh, sadly, uh, these kings did not. And eventually, God raised up the Babylonians. And their king, Nebuchadnezzar, came to Judah, destroyed it, broke its walls, demolished the temple, took the best and the brightest of the people to Babylon as captives. And that period in the uh, history of the Jewish people, that is known as the exile. And the exile is significant not only for uh, Jewish people, but it's significant for us as believers because it was during the exile when uh, these people who had heard from God that he was going to bless them with land and that a Messiah would come. It was during this period that a number of God's prophets came to the people and told them a Messiah is coming. That Messiah we know to be Jesus Christ. Now, there were some books, just to kind of help us here, uh, there were some books that were written before the exile. Think 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and Jeremiah. And if you read Jeremiah, uh, a lot of Jeremiah's word is that God is going to punish. Stop doing evil. They didn't listen. They were taken into exile. But even while they were in exile in Babylon and then uh, a Persia, God still sent prophets. He still raised up men and women. Ezekiel was a prophet during the time of exile. Esther was written uh, during the time of exile. And Daniel. And then when they came back into the land that God had promised them, God had promised to Abraham, God still raised up people. And there were books such as Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Malachi, and the book that we are looking at this morning, uh, Zechariah, these were written after the people of Israel had come out of exile back into the land, back into the promised land, back into their homeland. Now in chapter 4, where the message is taken from, uh, we have the, the fifth of six visions that Zechariah received. And Zechariah was both a priest and a prophet, and he had come back to Jerusalem. He had come back to Israel uh, from Babylon. He was one of the first set of exiles. And his ministry, get this loved ones, his ministry was based on hope and encouragement to those Jews who were struggling to rebuild the temple. And he had a message of hope and encouragement to the governor Zerubbabel. Because he 
was discouraged. And the vision in chapter 4 came when the Israelites were at their lowest point because the, the, the progress on the rebuilding of the temple had stopped. The work was hard. Opposition had increased from without. People were complaining that uh, this new temple looked nothing like the glorious edifice that Solomon had built. In addition, the focus of the people had shifted from finishing the temple to other pursuits. One of the things that they had done, they had started to focus on their own homes. And Haggai, a contemporary of Zechariah, challenged the people. And he warned them that they were putting God second by forgetting the temple. And they had forsaken the work of God for 17 years. And while the foundation was laid, at this time of writing, the temple had not yet been constructed. 17 years, the temple stayed there unfinished. Anybody ever built a house for 17 years? It's okay. <laughs> but it's not okay when it's the temple of God. And I want to say this, loved ones, the work of God is always opposed it is always opposed. It's opposed from without persecution, affliction, threats. But even from within, complaints and grumblings, divisions, messed up priorities, loss of focus, resistance to change, power struggles, selfish ambitions, pride, sinful patterns. All of these happen to oppose the work of God. The minute the people of God say, we are going to do what God is calling us to do, opposition arises. And when that opposition comes, leaders lose heart. They lose focus. Workers, they lose heart. They lose focus. And the work stops. And not just any work, but the work of God the work of God stops. Grumbling is so dangerous. It is so dangerous. And I want to warn us, lovingly warn us, let's not be a grumbler. Let's not be a complainer. Close to two million people uh, left Egypt heading to the promised land. And time after time after time, they would grumble. Uh, scripture, 14 times they grumble against Moses and God. We don't have enough water. We don't like how this manna tastes. It's too hot. It's too dusty. Who are you? Why are you leading us? On and on and on and on and on they went. And Moses, God blessed his heart. Well, he's dead. But God blessed his heart. Five times Moses interceded for them. Five times God himself was like, I've had enough. I've had enough with these people. I'm going to bring the hammer down. God doesn't talk like that. That's just me. Right? I'm going to bring the hammer on them. And, and Moses ran to God and said, God, please, no, forgive them, forgive them. Fourteen times they grumbled. Five times Moses ran and said, God, forgive, forgive. Because they were opposing what God was wanting to do. Guess how much entered the promised land? Two. Out of close to two million people, two entered the promised land. In Exodus 16, this is what God, this is what Moses said. The Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us. Your grumbling is not against man, but it is against God. It is against the Lord. But I want to say this. To those of you who are tired, you are burnt out, you are discouraged, you are losing strength. I want to say this, that God provides strength for his work. Amen? It was a good place to give an amen. amen. All right? God provides the strength and the resources and all that you need for his work. I want to stress that. Right? God provides the strength for his work. 
God says, if you're going to do my work, then I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you power so that you can do the work that I have called you to do. But if you want to do your own thing, you're on your own. You're on your own. And if you want to do my work in your own strength, then you're on your own. But I have called you to do my work in my strength. And whether that work is uh, the work of preaching and teaching, whether that work is the work of encouragement, whether that work is uh, uh, the work of prayer or worship, God provides the strength. You don't have to be burnt out. You don't have to be tired. You don't have to be discouraged. God provides the strength. So for those who are serving in church, and not just in Harvest, but those who are uh, listening online, and you may be serving in your church, I want to say this to you, God gives you the strength. Call on him and ask him for strength. For those of you who are thinking, I can't serve because I don't have time. I can't serve because I'm tired. I can't serve because... Bam, 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 bam. Let me say this to you. God will give you the strength to do it. It's his work. He will provide the strength. I'm excited by this. I'm a little, you know, I'm getting a little bit hot under the collar. <laughs> but this is important. If there's anything that you hear today, it's this. When you do God's work, when you sign up, to do God's work, he supplies the strength. Call on him. Call on him for that strength. Okay, here's our point number one. You can write this down. The work is great. The work is great. In verse 7, it says, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Uh, the use of the term, O great mountain, represented the enormity of the work that had to be done in finishing the temple. As I mentioned, 17 years had passed between the start of the construction of the temple and the present time, and it was still unfinished. And Zerubbabel needed the encouragement and the hope and the strength. And the word to him was, the size of the task looks like a mountain. It looks huge. It looks big. It looks overwhelming. But guess what? If you do it in my strength, it would become a plain. Now, why was God so insistent on rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the temple? Let me share this with you. Uh, the temple represented... Um, a key, the temple was a key thing in the life of the Israelites. It was integral to their worship. It was a part of their identity as a nation. The temple represented God's presence among his people. It also represented the people's worship of God. So get this, if the temple represented God's presence among the people, because God had given specific instructions for its construction, the temple housed the Ark of the Covenant, which represented uh, uh, God's presence, then what did it mean that they had not prioritized fixing and rebuilding the temple? It meant that they were not prioritizing a relationship with God. The unfinished temple wasn't just because the price of material had raised. The unfinished temple wasn't just that the people needed to build their own house. The unfinished temple reflected a hard condition. The temple represented the presence of God. These people, God's chosen people, were comfortable without God's presence. Are you? Are you comfortable without seeing God's move in your life? In the life of this church? Are you comfortable with seeing a little of God? 
Are you willing to do whatever it takes to see the transformative power of God, not just in your life and in your family's life, but in this church and throughout this island? And that was a question that the children of Israel was faced with. And their response was like, yeah, we're comfortable. We don't mind if God ain't moving. We don't mind if the Spirit of God is absent. Because that was what not finishing the temple represented. No, there was a greater uh, implication. The deeper meaning was that the people of God, check this, the people of God were not desperate enough for the presence of God in their midst. What a conundrum. The people of God were not desperate enough for the presence of God. They were comfortable with being called the people of God. They were comfortable with being known as the people of God. They were comfortable with the label. But they weren't desperate enough for the presence of God in their midst. Let me throw this back on you. What about you? Is it enough to be known as a Christian at your workplace? Is it enough to be known as a church-going person? Or are you desperate for the powerful, life-changing presence of God in your life? The Jews in Zerubbabel's time, they were comfortable with the label, but not desperate enough for the presence. Now the prophet Ezekiel, in chapters 8 to 11, he saw in a vision the glory of God leaving the temple. But later in his prophecies, chapters 40 to 48 to be specific, he sees a rebuilt temple. Now remember Ezekiel was a prophet? A priest that was raised up during the exile. So he sees in a vision that the temple is rebuilt. And he sees the presence of God returning to the temple. Amen. And then he sees something amazing happen. So in Ezekiel 47, uh, verse 12, he sees water. Water is flowing from the temple. And wherever the water goes, it brings life. Look at what the text says. And on the banks, verse 12, for your reference, it's going to be on the screen. And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month. Anybody who's ever planted anything here knows that nothing grows every single month, right? There are seasons. So we know that this is supernatural, and then it goes on, because, but why is it growing? He goes on, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. If you know anything about Revelation, this songs like what's going to happen at the end of time. This songs like heaven. The presence of God, wherever it goes, it brings life and healing and health, and blessings. And God had called the nation of Israel, he had called the descendants of Abraham to be carriers of the presence of God. He had called them to take God's presence and to go forth with God's presence to the nations. Look at what Isaiah 49 verse 6 says, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So between Ezekiel's vision and Isaiah's prophecy, the presence of God was designed not for Israel alone. It was not to become a monument to how great they were, but they were called to be witnesses and to be carriers of God's presence to the nations of the world. They were to take the presence of God and they were to carry it through the world. And wherever they went, life and healing and blessings were to follow. 
but they had stopped. See, the presence of God that I'm challenging you to be desperate for is not just for you. It's so that blessings could come to your home. It's that blessings could come to your workplace. Anybody who rubs up against you should feel blessed. Just like Potiphar recognized that the blessings that flew that fl um, flowed in his life and on his property was as a result of uh, Joseph's work. Just like Jacob's uncle, Laban, recognized that God was blessing him because of Jacob. It's God's intention that as you become carriers of the blessings of God, carriers of the presence of God, that you will bring blessing wherever you go. Your home, your community, and this nation will be blessed because of you. I want to turn your attention to scripture, John 7, 38 and 39. Look at what it says. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Song familiar? Songs very similar to what Ezekiel sees, right? So, watch this river of living water. Now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. In Zerubbabel's day, the temple represented the presence of God that the Israelites were to take and to go throughout the nations around them and the nations far afield and they were to carry the presence of God. But there's no temple now. Guess who's the temple? You know your Bible. You've been reading. You're the temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. You are the temple. The Spirit of God dwells in you. You are now, according to Matthew chapter 28, you are now to carry God's presence into your world. So the blessings of God on your life is not just for you. You are to be a conduit. And the people around you will benefit because a presence carrier, a person in whom the Holy Spirit lives, is in their midst. Because out of your heart, out of your mouth, out of your life should be flowing rivers of living water. You know what that means in a practical sense? You should be blessing your workplace. I don't want to mash anybody's corn, but your workplace is not a plantation. Is it? Is it a plantation? It feels like a plantation? If you think it's a plantation, let me say this. You have no idea what working on a plantation feels like. Neither do I. <laughs> but it's not a plantation. Bless it. Let me challenge you guys. Tomorrow, go in early. Amen? <laughs> when I mean early, and I don't mean work starts at 8 and you're floating 2 past 8. I'm talking like 7.45, all right, before the security guard reaches and pronounce a blessing on the people who work there. Father, I bless them. Bless your boss. Tomorrow is bless your boss Monday, <laughs> all right? It's bless your boss Monday. Bless them. Father, I pray for them. Father, look at the desires of their heart and bless them. Bless their home. 
bless their families. Help them to be the best possible leader they can be. Bless your co-workers. That's what you're called to be. The carrier of God's blessings. So the desert places of your life. You bring life when you bless. Here's point number two. I'm going to go a little faster with these two points. The work is great. Point number two is this, but it can only be done supernaturally. It can only be done supernaturally. In the vision, Zechariah saw a lampstand of gold with seven lamps and a bowl at the top, which served as a reservoir for the oil. He saw two trees, each with a branch, next to the lampstand. He saw a golden pipe went out from each branch to the bowl, and he saw olive oil pouring from the tree. Out of the bowl, according to most commentators, came 49 spouts or pipes, seven to each of the seven lamps on the lampstand. This lampstand was similar to the one that stood in the holy place of the tabernacle. But there were three, different, there were three exceptions. One, the bowl on top of it, the seven pipes to each lamp, and the two olive trees. You know what these represent? The abundant, continuous supply of oil to the lamps. One of the more tedious duties of the temple service was the constant care of the lamps on the golden lampstand. They had to be continually filled with oil, cleaned of soot, and their wicks had to be maintained but in the vision, Zechariah sees self-filling lamps fed directly from two olive trees without the help of man. The lamp stand with the seven lamps signifies the task that God gives to his people to be a light to the nations, to reveal God and his truth to those who walk in darkness. The oil that flows in continual abundant supply so that the lamps can go on burning symbolizes the Holy Spirit. The power to reveal God's glory to the nation comes from the working of the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You are to be a light to the nations. And the power to be a light to the nations comes from the Holy Spirit. Here's our third point. Write this down. By my spirit, says the Lord. Look at what verse 6 says. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zer Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. By my spirit. You're called to be a light. And that's a huge task. But God says, my spirit is with you. My spirit goes with you. The only resource that Zerubbabel needed was the Holy Spirit. To do God's work of finishing the temple. Calling the people back to worship. Reminding them of their duty to go out and be presence carriers. The only resource he needed was the Holy Spirit. And we fail when we do not depend and call upon the Holy Spirit to be with us. So I want you to note a few things. Note this. We need the continuous power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to be a witness of God to the nations, if you're going to be a blesser to those around you, you need the continuous power of the Holy Spirit. You can do God's work in two ways. You can use your own strength, and by now I think you have gotten it. That ends in failure. Or you can depend on God's strength. You can depend on God's spirit. You can cry out for God's strength and his spirit. Here's the second thing. We need to be filled all the time. We need to be filled all the time. 
The story is told of a, a lady who asked uh, the great evangelist D.L. Moody. She said, why do you talk so often about the need for being filled with the Holy Spirit? You're always stressing the need to be filled again and again. Why isn't once enough to be filled? And Moody replied, I leak. We know from Scripture, Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that once we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit. But we must learn, according to Galatians 5, 16, we must learn to walk by the means of the Spirit. That means we must learn to continuously, repeatedly be dependent on the Holy Spirit. In the vision, Zechariah was asleep and he had to be awakened. Some of us are in a sleep-like state, trying to do God's work. Zechariah was awakened from the vision. He was asked, what do you see? And he responded. He saw the trees providing oil to the lamps so that they did not burn out. And the trees represent the need for us to be dependent upon God and God alone. He saw the wick burning, not because it was trimmed by human hands, but because there was a constant flow of oil. There was a constant flow of oil. If the wick is not supplied, it will not burn. But in Zechariah's vision, he sees constant flow of oil. If we are not filled, we can't do the work of God. See a little task I ask you to do? To go and be a blesser to your workplace tomorrow. The Spirit of God is not filling you. It's going to be so hard for you to bless your boss and your colleagues. It's going to be so difficult. You'll feel as if there's a lump at your throat when you say, Father, Swallow. Father, please bless me. Mm. You'll struggle. I see Stanley laughing. Some of you are bosses. And, uh, <laughs> some of you are employers. So you should be saying, Father, bring them, bring them. <laughs> we can't do it without God's strength. We must be filled all the time to do it. Here's the third thing. When the Spirit works in us, others benefit. When the Spirit works in us, others benefit. Here's what Charles Feinberg points out about oil. Oil here represents, it's a symbol for the Holy Spirit. Here's what he points out about oil. He says oil lubricates. Oil lubricates. You know what the Holy Spirit wants to do? He wants to make your relationships harmonious. Remove all the friction. You ain't talking to this one. You ain't talking to that one. You and that one have beef. You all had beef in school. Nah. nah, nah. The Holy Spirit wants to remove all of that friction and create harmonious relationships. Here's the second thing. Oil heals. Many of us have been wounded in life in one way or the other. The Holy Spirit wants to bring healing to our wounded hearts. He wants to soothe our sorrows. Thirdly, oil lights. What does this speak to? The Spirit wants to illuminate God's word. The Spirit wants to give us direction for life. You can call upon the Holy Spirit. What should I do in this moment? What should I say in this moment? Faced with a major decision, you should cry to the Holy Spirit. What should I do? Fourthly, oil warms. It's okay. Continue preaching the gospel to those around you. Because you know what? The Holy Spirit will melt cold hearts. The Holy Spirit will bring those who are unresponsive to him. You share the story, your story. You share the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Here's the other thing. Oil invigorates. 
Zerubbabel was tired and discouraged. I could imagine he felt like a failure. Oil gives strength. The Holy Spirit gives us energy and strength and durability, and he gives us all the resource that we need. Oil adorns. In the Old Testament, oil was used to adorn the body during times of joy. The fruit of the Spirit in our life is God's joy. The Spirit will bring joy to your life. And then lastly, oil polishes. The Spirit smooths the rough edges from our lives as he produces his fruit of kindness and gentleness. As we continually depend upon the supply of God's Spirit, we will be used to bless others. And you have heard in this series that the Holy Spirit was working in creation. You have heard in this series that the Holy Spirit uh, was opening. The, the Holy Spirit opened and closed the Red Sea. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 to 14 tells us that the Spirit gives life to dead bones. And it is the same Spirit who lives in you, who lives in us. And it is the same Spirit that I'm calling you to be dependent upon. Because He will constantly, constantly supply. In verse 7 it says this. This is the word to Zerubbabel. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. What does that mean? When the temple is finished, when the temple is finished, and they were all gathered around, and that final stone was to be placed. You know what everybody would say? Grace! You know what that means? They would all give glory to God. When you depend upon the strength that the Holy Spirit gives, when you depend upon the might and the energy that the Holy Spirit gives. You know what people would say of you? God's working. God is at work. He is at work there. He's at work in their lives. And I started by saying when I got up here that God is at work. And I want to remind you, he is at work in our midst. He is at work. In our midst. Depend upon the Holy Spirit to do the things that He has called you to do. You don't have to feel burnt out, you don't have to be discouraged. Holy Spirit brings joy. You don't have to give up on your marriage. The Holy Spirit could bring that relationship together again. You don't have to be frustrated at your workplace. The Holy Spirit can give joy. The work that he has called you to do, he supplies with strength. I want us to pray now. But I want to give you some space to ask God, for an abundant supply of his spirit. Because some of us might be leaving here this morning and going into situations that are really difficult. And we've been asking, how long, how long, how long? And you may be dreading tomorrow or dreading this evening or dreading next month or whenever. But I want you to call on God for an abundant supply of his spirit in your life. Let's do that now. Eyes closed. Speak to God. Cry out to him. I want to say the same for those who are watching online in your living room, wherever you are. God has called you to do something. Cry out to him now. Ask for an abundant supply of the Holy Spirit.
Get desperate, loved ones. Get desperate for God's spirit, for God's presence. It's not just for you. Father, we need a work. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your spirit, Father. We need your spirit. Fill us.